This is a video introduction to HPLC, which stands for High Performance Liquid Chromatography. Sometimes you hear High Pressure Liquid Chromatography. This material is from Chapter 24 of your Analytical Chemistry textbook. The first thing we should talk about is the parts of the instrument. The injection valve is the first thing that your sample sees. It's the way your sample gets into the instrument. Uh, you can use variable volumes, depending on the concentration of your analyte. Uh, and you can actually bolt an auto sampler onto your instrument to make things a little easier practically. The solvents are pumped into the injection valve and then onto the column by a solvent pump. The characteristics of this thing mean uh, are mainly that it has a steady, high pressure, reproducible flow. You can use multiple pumps or you can use one uh, pump with multiple valves for a gradient elution, which I'll talk about later. The solvents, before they hit the pump, go through a solvent degasser, and the idea of this is to remove dissolved gas, because that uh, dissolved gas makes high pressure reproducible flow really difficult. It's much easier to pump uh, a liquid than it is to pump a gas with constant flow. Um, and then we have the column. The columns are about 20 centimeters long, maybe a little longer, in contrast to GC columns, which are meters long. They contain a packed stationary phase, and they may also have a guard column, which is shorter uh, and sort of not as good at separating things. The purpose of the guard column is to take out any big impurities that would damage the main column. And then finally, we have a detector. What it looks like when you walk into a lab and see an HPLC is something like this, just a series of boxes. On top, you usually have the solvent bottles. They can also sit off to the side. The degasser is the, sort of the next thing down, and then typically you have the pump below that, the columns below that, and so the solvent flow goes from the bottles through the degassing membranes, through the injector, and is pumped onto the column, and then finally into the detector, which can be UV, it can be a fluorescence detector, or you can use a mass spectrometer. And the signal from the detector gets read by a computer and turned into a chromatogram. So the injection valve, like I said, is, when, is where your sample gets introduced into the instrument. And injection valves have two positions, the loading and the injecting position. In the loading position, the syringe is connected to an injection loop or a sample loop that has some volume. They have all different volumes. Uh, and when you inject, you fill up the sample loop and then put a little extra in until you see drips coming out of the drain where it says to waste. That's how you know your sample loop is full. When you turn the valve to the inject position, now the uh, pump flow is, is not bypassing the sample loop anymore. It's connected directly to the sample loop. And so the pump will push solvent onto your column. And it will push exactly the volume of the injection loop. No matter how much you injected with the syringe, it's going to put in that 10 microliters or 100 microliters or whatever the vamp volume of your sample loop is. From there, the sample and the mobile phase solvent go into the HPLC column. And there are many different kinds of these things, which all have their own uses. They can go from a nano column, uh, which is extremely small, very low flow rate, very low sample capacity, up to a process column that might be used by a drug company, uh, where you can do 20 grams, um, in a 20 grams of sample in the column, 300 milliliters per minute. In any case, inside the column is the column packing, which is the stationary phase. And so you can either do liquid solid chromatography or you can do partition chromatography. And the difference is the identity of this solid phase. Um, in either case, these are packed columns. And so you have very small, ideally reproducible particle size. The idea of that is to reduce the terms in the Van Diemter equation that lead to band broadening. I'll show you the equation in a minute. The stationary phase is in the column, and so the solvents that are pumped through constitute the mobile phase. Characteristics of mobile phase solvents are that they are very high purity, uh, and they can either be aqueous or organic, and you usually use a mix of the two depending on what you're trying to separate. The reason that we want them to be high purity is because we don't want to either detect the impurities at the detector or have dissolved gases or other things that can give us a bad signal at the detector. The solvents that you use significantly influence the retention. So changing the different solvents that make up the mobile phase 
can have a powerful effect on the amount of separation that your HPLC is able to do. Solutes are ranked by their ability to displace the solute from the column in a series called an eleutropic series. And what this means is that some solvents are better at moving some analytes through the column, others are better at leaving the analytes on the column and increasing the retention time. In the case where you only use one solvent or one composition of solvent as your mobile phase, you're doing a technique called isocratic elution. And so isocratic elution here does not mean that your mobile phase is entirely organic or entirely aqueous. So in these cases, uh, these four chromatograms have varying degrees of the ratio of aqueous to organic. 90% organic on the left down to 60% organic on the right. And you see that the amount of separation of various of the peaks changes. Some of the peaks don't, though. Peaks 2 and 3 always co-elute in this case. And so changing the mobile phase composition but having it stay constant through the whole chromatogram obviously is not good enough to separate whatever mixture of eight compounds this is. In GC, we talked about solving this problem with a temperature profile. In HPLC, we do, instead of a gradient uh, isocratic elution, we do a gradient elution, where we change the composition of the mobile phase over time. So in this case, same eight compounds, you see that peaks two and three now do not co-elute anymore. They come out at different times because of the changing composition of the mobile phase. So, once you can separate your peaks, you need to worry about how broad they get. As a reminder, the Van Diemter equation uh, contains these three terms. The A term is for the multiple paths, uh, does not depend on the flow rate. The B term in the middle is the longitudinal diffusion term, and then C is the equilibration or mass transfer term, and those two do depend on the flow rate. As compared to GC, the longitudinal diffusion for HPLC is negligible because much less diffusion is able to happen in a liquid than in a gas. The A term uh, is directly proportional to the particle diameter of the packing of the column. Small particle sizes increase the efficiency, increase the number of theoretical plates, decrease the height of the theoretical plates. The problem with this is that it takes a lot higher pressure to pump liquid through a column that has many very small particles than one that has fewer bigger particles. So this is why the HP, the high pressure sometimes uh, is said for HP because these columns have to operate at a very high pressure in order to increase the efficiency by using smaller particles in the column. Uh, because of the smaller diffusion different distance, uh, the C term also is smaller. Um, so the diffusion distance comes in because when you have smaller particles, there's more stationary phase surface area, and so it's easier for the solute to adsorb to the column. It doesn't have to look for a place to go. It just it runs into some stationary phase, which has a high surface area, and so it can adsorb. For an HPLC column, the number of plates scales with this particle size, the DP, particle diameter, uh, and with the length of the column roughly as 3,000 times the length in centimeters over the diameter of the particles in micrometers. This is a rough uh, estimation, but it's usually pretty close. The, like I said, the pressure increases a lot as the particle size decreases, and so uh, typical pressures for an HPLC are roughly in the range of hundreds of atmospheres. A lot of pressure is required at an optimal flow rate of about one milliliter per minute. You can see this if you plotted out the Van Diemter curve, it would have a minimum of about one milliliter per minute. Detectors for HPLC, uh, generally, we want them to have the detector itself to have a small volume. And the reason for this is that we have pretty small concentrations that we're using in HPLC. Uh, the typical detector volume is about 10 microliters. And we will also want the detector to be pressurized so that when the high pressure solvent comes into the detector, any dissolved gas stays at high pressure and it doesn't come out into the gas phase. Uh, this would have a big effect, especially on light-based detectors.